So NXT TakeOver War Games Chicago. I have this sense that there will be many of you watching this video and ultimately opining in the comments section that enjoyed this show quite a bit more than I did. And you know what? That's okay, I guess. Different strokes for different folks, and it just wasn't that great of a show to me. I'm sorry. Like, just because people do big, spectacular things sometimes isn't enough. Just because people do moves, it isn't enough. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, again, I do not consistently watch NXT, which, if anything, might be potentially helpful in a way because it allows me to come at this from a fresher point of view and not being quite as worried about the storylines and the characters and so be it. But I take a look, let's say, at this women's war games match, which I thought out of the two war games matches was definitely the better one. You start with this Dakota Kai heel turn. You know, earlier on on the pre-show, Mia Yim was attacked and everybody was talking about it was Dakota Kai. So it wasn't like this was a great big surprise. Now, I will say that I thought it was pretty well done. Like, she savaged the blonde in the cage. She got heat on herself. But people saying that this was masterful booking and so forth, eh. I would have said maybe if you wanted to really get heat on her, like next level type of heat, at least with that crowd, because you're dealing with a bunch of match marks, the number one thing you could do to piss off those match mark fans is to take the match away from them have Dakota Kai be the last person to get in the ring, have her tease that this is going to be her big moment, have like a kendo stick in her hand or something, and then just start whacking the hell out of everybody on her team. And then, after you get over on the babyface team for a few minutes, then, because it's a War Games match, Dakota Kai leaves the cage and her team loses. Now that would have taken the heat to a whole nother level. What's really interesting to me about this is you do this big freaking turn to make this big deal about it ultimately being four on two and it didn't matter because the underband babyface team won any dang ways. And it's like, really? So the heel turn didn't matter? You know what I mean? Now that said, at least I could say they're trying to create a monster babyface in Rhea Ripley and I saw enough in the match to where I kind of get it and I kind of understand it. This may be one of these things where you can't serve all your masters. Maybe. But, but the match, especially the last 10 plus minutes, it, it was interesting. It's just, you know, kind of one of those matches that, frankly, I could take it or leave it. But a lot of you will take it, and I can, frankly, kind of leave it. But I do think it was better than the men's one. Um, the triple threat number one contenders match. You got Killian Dane. He's a bigger guy, like 300-pound fat ass. They don't have many of those. Then you have this Damian Priest guy. You know, this is my first real chance of checking him out at any length. And he looks like a future main event star. So, of course, because this is NXT and God, Ugga, has this fascination for doing the highest production value indie fed in the world, Pete Dunn is the one that won with this wet fart of a finish. This match was just, it was a good showcase for Dane and especially for Priest. I just, I'm not digging the Pete Dunn shtick. Like, he's trying to be some Taz wannabe and it just doesn't work for me. He's clearly way smaller than the other two guys, yet he's trying to go man out. It's just, bleh. And now he's the one that's going to face off against Adam Cole at Survivor Series. And you're going to say, oh, now you got a heel versus the babyface. And was that's when the hell do you match marks care about the heel and face dynamics? Ugh. It's just, I look at that stuff. And, and I just look at Pete Dunne and I say, you know what? What is so different and so special about him? He looks just like so many of these asshats all throughout professional wrestling. I'm sorry, he does. He does. And then you go to the next match. Finn Balor versus Matt Riddle. I gotta ask, Finn Balor's supposed to be a heel. What's the difference? I didn't see really any difference in the way he conducted and carried himself. I really didn't see any difference in the way he worked his match. What's the difference? 
Why would we hate him? Why would we want to see Matt Riddle beat him? Which then still brings me to the question of what's the appeal of Matt Riddle? Part of it is, again, I don't watch NXT a ton. So I'm trying to guide the gauge what the appeal is here. Somebody put on there that it was some type of millennial type of MMA RVD. Okay, I could see that maybe. Sure. But does that mean he's better right now as a face? Or is it heel? I don't really know. But as I'm watching Matt Riddle, the one thing that keeps running through my mind is, why wouldn't Finn Balor just attack his bare feet? Why wouldn't every opponent of Matt Riddle just attack his bare feet every single time? No, it's just something kind of grated on me and something kind of irritated me. And I know I'm just an old fuddy-duddy, but seriously, I mean, why wouldn't they just attack his damn feet? I don't know. Actually, kind of got into this match, I will say. I liked it more than the Triple Threat number 1 Contenders match because while those guys were doing some really good stuff, and I did appreciate the fact that it was a Triple Threat match and all three of the guys were in the ring the majority of the time, that was different to me, and I liked that. It felt like that match went about five to seven minutes too damn long. And the wrong guy won with a bullshit-ass finish. At least here, this match felt like it went just about the right amount of time. And it felt like my, my sense of seeing people on social media during this match was they're kind of torn. Because they didn't think Matt Riddle should lose, but they also didn't think Finn Balor should lose. And I could, I could see both of those viewpoints, and they're probably both right. But the reality is, is you should have Finn Balor winning here. He's the first ever Universal Champion. He's been on the main roster for a longer period of time. You just recently did this character turn with Finn Balor. He should win. Now, should Finn have had to cheat to win? Perhaps. Maybe it would have worked there. Because otherwise, I didn't see what was so heelish about this gimmick. And frankly, looking at Matt Riddle, it kind of felt miscast, like he's the one that people should be booing, because he seemed kind of grating and annoying to me. And believe me, if anybody knows grating and annoying, it's me. I'm just saying. Uh, the solid match feels like right guy won. No other major gripes or complaints there. Which leads me to the main event. That's right. We're four matches on the main card. At least I will say this. With the show starting at 7 on Sunday night, or Saturday night, excuse me. Two and a half hours-ish and you're done. That's good. That is one thing I always appreciate about NXT. Now, flip side of that is they choose to have so few matches that every match seems to go a little too long. I understand these are your big shows, and especially for NXT, they don't do a lot of them. But there's also a part of me, were there other people that they could have featured on the show? Maybe had six matches, shorten the length of a couple of these matches? Probably would have felt like the right thing. Or maybe you mix in some stuff like interviews, better uh, video packages to hype up the reason for each of these matches. Like the presentation was severely lacking, and Triple H should damn good and well know better! And clearly he's forgotten. Clearly he has lost his way. Of this men's war games match. I'm sorry, I look at the Undisputed Era and I see Undisputed Lanes. To me, this is the epitome of what professional wrestling has become. Like, even listen to the names Adam Cole, Roderick Strong, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly. Their names are lame, their group looks lame, individually they look lame, and collectively they look even lamer. Like, this is the true epitome of vanilla midgets, and yet the match marks geek out for them. Why? Because Adam Cole says, Bye! Well, woo! I mean, real talk, man. Come on! The hell is so appealing about these guys? What is different or what is unique about them? The answer is nothing. Then on the flip side, you look at Team Ciampa. Daddy's home. Ciampa's not a monster. He's not a huge dude. But there is something interesting and compelling about him. You look at him and you say, okay, that is a professional wrestler. You look at the Dijakovic guy. You say Donovan looks like a professional wrestler. You most certainly look at that big grizzly man, Keith Lee, and you see professional wrestler. Like you look at these three guys 
and then you look at undisputed era. Do you see the difference here? And if undisputed era was kind of unique in the fact that you didn't have a lot of guys like them, then they would probably be more interesting to me than the other team. But the fact is you have so many other guys that are literally just like them on NXT, on Raw, on SmackDown, on AEW, you name it, doesn't matter, that they are just another group of lanes. They just blend into the crowd. And they look like the typical jabronis you would see doing pretend wrestling in their backyards on a Saturday afternoon. And what was really ridiculous to me about this was earlier on in the night, you had the babyface team win with Candice LeRae and Rhea Ripley four on two. So now you got freaking Ciampa and these two big Goliaths and Dijakovic and freaking Lee. And they're sitting there and struggling against fucking undisputed air. Are you kidding me? And what's so ridiculous about this, you look at this, and they hadn't even announced yet who the fourth person was going to be. Why in the hell would they need him? Why? Look at these three. Look at these four. Why would these three need help to beat these four? Especially when you just had the women win two on four. This doesn't help the undisputed lanes, and it doesn't help Team Choppa. It's dumb. The best thing you could argue about the whole match was Kevin Owens' return in his vintage gear with his vintage music. It was a great moment. Here's Kevin Owens back on NXT. All right, now the team that shouldn't need the help as it is, now the odds are even. Bring it home, boys. Because nothing was going to top it. Now, of course, because it's modern wrestling, we got to go another 15 plus minutes so everybody can get their crap in. And we got to do this 50 50 garbage. Instead of just going home and saving yourselves the 15 minutes of wear and tear on your body. Especially when seven of you have to wrestle the next night on Survivor Series. There is no reason that this men's war games match went this dang long. There just is no reason. If you need to fill time, then fill the time with a shorter match or two throughout the night. Do other things to shake up the presentation. Don't sit there and have almost a 40-minute men's war game match when you only need 20 or 25. You could say the right team won, but again, that was kind of a... Like even the ending, Chomp by having to take, what was it, coal off of the top of the cage and go down to the table, just felt unnecessary. Again, it just felt like we got to do crap to get crap in. We had planned this, and you just didn't need it. I'm all for doing the extreme stuff when it's called for, when the story calls for it, when it's needed. But if you don't need it, don't do it. Especially when some of you are working the next damn night. Don't do it. Ah, that almighty. Yeah, this is going to be one of these typical spot fest filled shows with a limit of personality and characters and compelling stories that a lot of the NXT diehards and blowhards are going to sit there and tout to kingdom frickin' come. Meanwhile, I'll just sit there as this kind of angry wrestling man looking and saying, what the hell is the big deal? What is so special about this?